So I'd like to uh, welcome you all to Slack tonight. My name is Lance Dixon, and I'd like to thank you all for coming out here on such a cold and wet night. It's a great turnout. And I also should mention just a couple uh, safety things. That we have some exits down here, as well as the ones you came in through. And uh, a couple other things we have in store for you. you you're welcome to pick up these uh, Symmetry magazines at any time. And after the talk, there will be uh, coffee and cookies and a chance to talk to the uh, physicists who are identifying themselves around the audience with these uh, yellow name tags, as well as, of course, to talk to our speaker tonight. Now, it's quite appropriate that it's very wet tonight because today's talk is about all those hydrogen atoms that are locked inside all of those water droplets that were falling down around you today. And our speaker is uh, Jennifer Leish, and uh, she's a postdoctoral researcher at SLAC, and she works at the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Laboratory, which is uh, the half of SLAC called Photon Science. Her uh, background is that she has a PhD in chemistry and material science from the Colorado School of Mines, and she was also working at the uh, National Renewable Energy Laboratory in Colorado while she was there. So that research focused on uh, solar cells uh, based on very thin films, and especially those that can be used to directly produce hydrogen. But now at SLAC, she's doing the reverse side of the equation. She's studying synchrotron, using synchrotron x-rays to study how to improve uh, fuel cells, which allow you to consume hydrogen gas and produce energy. And she's ideally situated, therefore, to give us the, the big picture on the hydrogen economy and how hi hydrogen might play an important role in the energy future of the world. And so I'd like you to welcome her as she gives this talk, Hydrogen Fueling the Future. Thanks. Is this okay? Louder, more? Can everybody hear me in the back? Yes, okay. Um, thanks, Lance, for that introduction. Uh, and I think a lot of people have read the abstract of what I'm going to talk about today. And I'm going to talk about hydrogen, but I'm going to start out talking really about renewable energy and where kind of all this fits into the picture of using hydrogen as an energy carrier in the future. So to give you an overview of what I'm going to talk about, um, I'm going to kind of pose this in sections of questions. So really, how do we use energy right now, both in the US and around the world? Uh, what is that connection between energy, carbon, which we hear a lot about, and climate, global warming, et cetera. Uh, and what does it mean to have carbon-free power? Uh, where can that carbon-free power come from? What is, what is the road towards that? Since uh, that's, that's a place where I think a lot of us know that we need to get to. Um, and then where the hydrogen economy fits into that. So, so what it is. And in talking about the hydrogen economy, we need to look at how we're going to make hydrogen, how we're going to store it, how we're going to transport it, get it to where we need it, and then, of course, how we're going to use it. And safety is something that always plays into any type of energy carrier, any type of fuel, of course. Uh, and then just talk a little bit about SLAC and SSRL and some of the research that's really being done right here uh, as far as this equation goes and where we're headed from that. So to give you an idea of how we use energy in the US, I think uh, we can extrapolate this worldwide by knowing that the US consumes about a quarter of all the world's energy every year. And that quarter is a total of about three terawatts, or three with a whole lot of zeros on the end of it, 12 to be exact. Uh, and we can actually, from what we know, break this down into how much we consume from each energy resource here in the US. And we can see that about 40% of it is petroleum, a lot of that going towards transportation. Um, and about a quarter is coal, a quarter natural gas. Uh, and the rest of this nuclear and renewables uh, constitute electricity generation here. And when you see usually a number that talks about renewables like this, this is actually hydroelectric and other renewables. And it's actually mostly hydroelectric. So sometimes you'll he hear people say renewables and non-hydro renewables. But here this wedge actually is hydro and other renewable energy technologies. And if we want to take a look at all of that power, that three terawatts, 
uh, we can actually break that down into, you know, by sector. So how much of that is used towards electricity? About 40% of all the energy we use goes towards electricity production. Uh, the next highest is transportation, about 30% towards transportation, and then of course we can't forget about industry and also residential and commercial use of energy. For example, natural gas that might come into your house uh, that you might use for cooking. And so just to put this in perspective, three terawatts is the equivalent of having 30 billion 100 watt light bulbs lit up 24 hours a day for an entire year. Uh, th that's a lot. <laughs> so that just hopefully gives you a little bit of an idea of how much energy we really do consume here in the US. And so from what we know about our energy consumption, we can always make projections. Something that we do know is that world population continues to go up. Uh, we do know that industrialized nations have a fairly stable, if not sometimes negative, population growth. So most of our population growth is happening in developing nations. Uh, by the year 2050, we're projecting between, I see numbers anywhere from 8 to 11 billion people in the world. Right now, we're at about 6.5 billion. And along with that, of course, we have energy demand that increases with that population growth. So, of course, as the number of people in, say, China or India are increasing, so is the energy demand of that country overall. So they want to have the same technologies available to them as we had as we were industrializing America. Uh, so, of course, as the demand for energy rises, so does the amount of carbon dioxide and other pollution related to burning fossil fuels rise as well. Something interesting to note is that as a population uh, starts to industrialize, so as a nation starts to industrialize, population growth actually slows. Uh, and so there's a trade-off here with uh, slowing population growth. Uh, we do increase our, our energy demand per GDP. Uh, so this is just kind of an interesting thing to note, is that we, we do want these countries to industrialize because the population growth will slow, but at the same time, industrialization means a much higher demand for energy. So we do know how we use energy. We know how many people there are going to be. Uh, we can make projections as to what the demand for energy is going to be, say, 20, 30, 40, 50, 100 years out from now. And by the year 2050, it's projected that we're going to need, oh, about, say, 30 terawatts of power. So just to put that in perspective, worldwide, we use about 14 or 15 terawatts of power last year. So we're talking about, by the year 2050, having to produce twice the amount of energy that we make every year by then. By 2100, if we continue on these trends, we're talking about needing about 45 terawatts of energy. And so what I've kind of identified here is something that I'm calling an energy gap. In other words, how much energy capability or energy production capability we're going to need uh, then compared to what we have now, or production capability or capacity now. So this energy gap, essentially, we could say it's 14 terawatts by the year 2050, 33 terawatts by the year 2100. That's a lot of energy. I mean, if you think about how much we make now and having to double that, we have this huge gap. So where is all of this going to come from? How are we going to double our current energy production capacity by the year 2050? There are a lot of things to consider uh, if we think about having to double that. Uh, of course, the first is, maybe the relationship between carbon dioxide or energy production and the environment. Uh, we do know that we make carbon dioxide or forms of carbon that go into the atmosphere uh, when we do burn fossil fuels. And all I'm showing here is data, uh, parts per million of, of CO2 in the atmosphere as a function of time uh, going up here in the recent years. And then our global average temperature, also here in blue, following that. So there is a definite link here between carbon dioxide emissions from fossil fuel burning, as well as the global average temperature. So this is kind of just a, a small piece of that uh, carbon climate connection that I was talking about. And here on the right, I have listed some things that are, are impacted by a global average increase in temperature. And these aren't large increases that are needed to impact these things. Uh, we can impact complete ecosystems and cause them to shift uh, as far as where on the planet they are. Uh, massive uh, either decreases or increases in food production, depending on, on where you live. You know, we might not be able to have avocados anymore in California, for example, and that would be a really big bummer. Um, <laughs> huge changes in patterns of disease. For example, tropical disease uh, that's typically mosquito-borne, malaria, for example, uh, changing global average temperature by increasing it could have huge impacts on 
both how often and where this disease is found. Uh, huge changes in, in local economies. If you're changing the ability to grow crops, for example, that's going to very adversely affect your economy. If you're losing land mass because of a rise in sea level, that's going to very adversely affect your economy of, of your country. Uh, catastrophic weather events, I think something that we're all familiar with since it's <laughs> thunderstorming outside right now. Um, that's something that can, of course, affect economies of countries as well as populations. Uh, another interesting thing is, is water. So the availability of water, the salinity of groundwater. So groundwater that's drinkable now might not be drinkable later. Uh, pre precipitation patterns, which also dictate how much water is available to certain populations in certain areas of the world. All these things are things that can be affected by very small increases in the global average temperature, which we know are linked to carbon dioxide in the atmosphere. So is it really bad? Everybody says it'd be really nice if it was a little bit warmer uh, in the winter, especially around here. Um, I, this, I think, is a great illustration of that question, is it bad? So what this is, is this is actually a model showing Florida in the black outline here. And what this model shows is if the Western Antarctic ice sheet were to melt, this is the smaller of the two ice sheets, this is something that could be feasible and could happen uh, in 50 or 100 years. And that ice sheet, if it were to melt, would cause about a five meter increase in sea level globally. There's a lot of places that, that lie under five meters above water, uh, Miami being one of them, and in fact, uh, large chunk of Florida, New Orleans, a large part of Louisiana. So this is just to give you an example of, well, how bad could it really be? I mean, this is devastating from a population standpoint, from an economy standpoint. Uh, there's a lot of things to think about here. And I think that uh, something recent just came out in the, the Chronicle that has the Bay Area, if the sea level were to rise by about a meter, if anybody's interested in seeing what the Bay Area would look like underwater. So the question that comes up then is, well, when is it time for us to really worry? Um, just to give you an idea, pre-industrial revolution, the concentration of carbon dioxide in the atmosphere was about 280 parts per million. Uh, last year, we hit 380 parts per million, and I think in, in January this year, it was 383 I saw somewhere. Um, if we were to not burn any more fossil fuels than we currently burn, so stabilize our emissions at the current level of emissions, we could eventually expect the atmosphere to equilibrate at about 560 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere. If we take what's called a business as usual approach, in other words, we continue increasing our fossil fuel emissions uh, along with our uh, energy production as projected, we're not really sure where those levels would stabilize. And a lot of people have identified that a range between 450 to 550 parts per million of CO2 in the atmosphere can cause about a two degree centigrade temperature rise, so global average temperature rise. So this two degrees absolutely can affect all those things that I talked about on that last slide. So these are all things that can and very quite possibly will <laughs> happen um, if we reach within this range. And as I said, if we just stabilize our emissions at current levels right now, in other words, either stop burning any more fuel um, or stop the demand for, for power uh, from rising, we're going to be actually above that range. So it, the answer to the question of when do we worry, I would say, is now. Now is time to worry. Last year was time to worry. So when do we stop? So if we're, if we're worrying, what, what's kind of that, that best case or worst case scenario that we can get to uh, as far as our current energy production and projected energy production? What I'm showing here, if you look at this black line, is just the increase in primary power production uh, over time. So these are all projections. And like I said, by the year 2050, uh, we're projected to need about 30 terawatts of primary power. Uh, that sets us up right with that about 14 terawatt gap in primary power. And these lines here show how much um, carbon producing uh, power it would take to stabilize the CO2 concentration in the atmosphere at that level. So if I can explain this a little better, the difference between this line and one of these colored lines gives us the amount of carbon-free or CO2-free energy that we would need to stabilize emissions. 
So here, if we were to stabilize at 550, which is kind of that higher danger zone level, in 2050, we would need to produce about 14 terawatts of carbon-free energy. So all of the energy that we make today, double that and make that all carbon-free. That's what we would have to do to maintain 550. If we were to go higher and say 750 parts per million in the atmosphere, which uh, I'm not really sure what would happen then, then this shows you know, less than that, maybe you know, eight terawatts of carbon-free power by the year 2050. So this is a huge challenge. So this is a many terawatt challenge. How are we gonna make 14 terawatts of carbon-free power in the future? So I've proposed a few near-term and long-term solutions. We have to think about things that we can do right now to start stabilizing current emissions. And in doing that, we have to think of things that are gonna be long-term solutions to solving this kind of carbon-free, many terawatt challenge. So in the near term, if we wanna start stabilizing current emissions at the level that they're at right now, one thing that we can do is energy efficiency. Energy efficiency both in transportation and in the electricity sector. Um, not only hybrid cars, but just increasing the total US um, vehicle fleet fuel efficiency, which is extremely low compared to other countries. Uh, that's one thing to think about. Cars in Japan get you know, over double the gas mileage as cars here in the US. Uh, another thing we can do is uh, stop deforestation or start reforestation. That's one thing that acts as a carbon sink. In other words, takes up carbon from the atmosphere. Now, these are not things that can completely solve our problem, but these are things that right now we can start to do to start to stabilize uh, current emissions. Did you have a question? Do you want to nuclear power shortly after COVID? We're going to talk, I'm going to talk about nuclear power. <laughs> Don't worry, we're getting there. Um, another thing that we need to do is deal with the carbon intensity of grid electricity. That's both through wind and through solar, uh, starting to implement those in a much larger scale. We do already have nuclear that makes up about 16% of our electricity generation here in the US. A little maybe more in the US, about 16% worldwide. Uh, and that's one thing at, that does attack the carbon intensity of grid electricity. So in the far term, something that we need to do is, is reduce worldwide emissions essentially to almost zero or within those danger levels to about 80% of what they are today. So making double the power with about a reduction to 20% of our current emissions today. So that's, that's a big challenge that we're talking about here. Uh, and in doing that, of course, the carbon intensity of the grid needs to be almost uh, completely eliminated, or at least as close to that as possible. And as well as the carbon intensity of our transportation infrastructure. So going towards either fuel cell or electric vehicles that use renewable fuels and electricity or carbon-free fuels and electricity to do that. So when we're examining a sustainable energy system, I think there's a lot of questions that we can ask. And my definition here of sustainable is energy systems that can last for millennia, not 50 years, not 100 years. Our grandchildren are gonna be around 100 years from now. So I think that we need to think of things that are gonna last 1,000 years or more. A lot of questions we can ask and a lot of answers that we can come up with. Of course, sustainability of those sources is the biggest question. What's the resource availability, both worldwide and in our own domestic, in our own countries? What's the energy payback on those technologies? In other words, how much energy do you have to put in uh, to create or make that technology versus how much energy you eventually get out of it? Of course, we need to have a positive energy payback on something like that. What are the environmental impacts of those technologies? What are the geopolitical factors involved in that? Uh, do we need to secure those, those technologies in another country, or is that something that we can do domestically? Uh, of course, what's the security in obtaining it? What's the availability to the developing world, or how can it impact the developing world, where we're gonna see the largest rise in these carbon dioxide emissions that I'm talking about? And what's the energy carrier gonna, gonna act as for a sustainable energy system like this? And so a lot of answers we can come up with Conservation and energy efficiency, like I said, are a small part of the puzzle. They're not gonna completely do it, of course. Uh, renewable energy technologies, biomass, solar, wind, geothermal, hydro, and wave. Nuclear, carbon sequestration, or perhaps some kind of diverse or mixed portfolio, depending regionally where we are, where we live. So some kind of all of the above answer. And so in asking these questions and getting these answers, um, what I wanted to do is just kind of 
break down possible ways we can meet this many terawatt challenge and what it's going to take from each of these technologies to supply. Here I just chose 10 terawatts uh, for some of these technologies because 10 is a very easy round number for us to deal with. Uh, from nuclear technologies, if we're going to provide about 10 terawatts of carbon-free energy, we would need to build 10,000 nuclear uh, power plants if they're one gigawatt reactors. And these are just the traditional nuclear power plants. These are not breeder reactors. Uh, that would mean building a nuclear power plant one every other day for 50 years. We currently have about 400, over 400 uh, nuclear reactors worldwide. Uh, and they are producing, like I said, about 16% of our global electricity production. Uh, I think that this is something that will continue to track with the increase in electricity demand. Uh, but this could be something that's a, a bit of a regulatory nightmare uh, in trying to get 10,000 new one gigawatt nuclear reactors built uh, here either. Well, of course, a portion of those would have to be in the United States since we consume 25% of the world's electricity. And some of those in developing nations, which um, maybe not, might not be the best thing for a new breeder technology reactor. Uh, some people do say that we have a fair, uh, semi-limited uh, recoverable amount of uranium. And this, of course, is just using old nuclear technology. I'm not taking into account uh, new breeder technologies, that we have about 300 terawatts of total recoverable uranium. So if you take into account a breeder technology, that's going to increase that by about 100. Uh, and that's not, I'm not, I'm talking recoverable. I'm talking about economically recoverable right now. Yes. Uh, so biomass. We hear a lot about biomass, and we hear a lot about ethanol and a lot about corn ethanol. Uh, some of these are fairly interesting things. Biomass uh, has a fairly low efficiency. So if you're thinking of taking sunlight or a photon that's hitting a plant and photosynthesizing it to make energy, you actually have about a third of 1% overall energy conversion efficiency with biomass. Uh, so 10 terawatts, you can do this calculation, requires about 150 million square kilometers, or pretty much all of the current agricultural land in the world. Uh, so one thing in thinking about that is how are we going to feed 8 to 10 billion people in the year 2050? So these are important things to think about when we're talking about a viable technology for doing this. Hydroelectric, we're all very familiar with dams. This is, like I said, hydro renewables is pretty much our, our largest kind of wedge of renewable energy or renewable electricity. Uh, technically feasible worldwide, there's about one and a half terawatts. We have about half of that currently installed. I don't think that number has changed a whole lot. Um, so this is essentially tapped out. We could think of it that way. This is not going to provide us with those 10 terawatts. Uh, but it, it does give us a decent chunk of carbon-free electricity. Carbon sequestration, in other words, the, the capture of carbon dioxide at a power plant and sequestering that, so keeping it from being released into the atmosphere. These are technologies uh, that are kind of currently in production. There's not any really huge scale demonstration um, successfully of this at this point. Um, but this does involve the point source capture, in other words, capture right at the power plant of carbon dioxide. Uh, and so then the resulting generation of electricity. Uh, we do need new types of coal-fired power plants in order to do this. So that's something to think about is, is commissioning all of these new types of power plants. Um, carbon sequestration is currently done for enhanced oil recovery. So this is something that, that oil companies do, is pumping CO2 into the ground in order to better extract oil that normally would be much more expensive. Geothermal, uh, there's a lot of global potential for this, but of course it depends on where you live as to how acceptable this technology is. Uh, we have a pretty small amount worldwide. Something interesting is that Iceland uh, is all geothermal and hydro, pretty much all of their energy. They live in a place where they can do that. They also have a much smaller, uh, less energy intensive population than the United States does there in Iceland. Uh, but this is something that I think will play into this energy portfolio that I'm talking about. Wind has a huge theoretical potential if we kind of boil that down to what's really practical. On land, there's about five terawatts of practical uh, wind, at least that's what I've seen. If you include offshore wind, I think that number goes up a, quite a bit. Um, and just in the U.S. alone, offshore wind, I've seen numbers that say we have about one terawatt of accessible offshore wind here in the U.S. Uh, worldwide, this still makes up a pretty small part of these many 
many terawatts that we currently consume. Um, in order to make about five terawatts, this number I have here, we need about one million wind turbines to make about five terawatts of power. Yes. I'm a little concerned that the existing so much wind that could stop NASA's uh, Nashville and Morrison going where they need to go and could cause its own climate problems. Well, I, I think that compared to the amount of buildings that we have built on land is probably quite small. I'm not sure about that, but. So uh, we have many more than one million buildings uh, on, on land right now. So sure, sure. Um, offshore, I think that's much less of an issue. Um, so on to my kind of favorite, since I think everybody heard that my background is in some uh, pho photovoltaic or solar energy technologies, is solar. We have way more energy uh, in the form of solar energy that hits the Earth uh, every year than we could really possibly ever imagine extracting or using. And this is actually the usable. So this is the amount that, that actually hits land, not the whole Earth. This is what hits land. This is what's not reflected back into the atmosphere. Uh, and if we wanted, and I chose 20 terawatts instead of 10 terawatts here for this example. Uh, 20 terawatts, we need about half of 1% of global land, and that's at a 10% conversion efficiency for solar. Right now, we have such a tiny amount of solar installed, uh, as you can see. So that's about 5 gigawatts worldwide solar installed. But the solar industry has a huge percentage of growth, so 25% growth, over 25% growth per year. But growth on a very small number is still a very small number, so that's something to point out. So our total installed renewables worldwide are roughly about 180 gigawatts, and I meant to change this to terawatts for everybody, 0.18 terawatts plus that from hydro. So if you include hydro, you know, that brings us to about a terawatt of renewable energy installed worldwide. So a terawatt of our 14 terawatts or a terawatt of our 30 terawatts in 2050. Um, is, is a very small number, but uh, I think as I'm trying to show here is that we definitely have the capability to do this carbon-free, to meet that energy gap in a carbon-free way. And I like to show this. Uh, what this shows is the land area that we would need in order to provide all of the U.S. annual electric demand. And so what this square is, this is 100 mile by 100 mile square in Nevada. Uh, so 10,000 square miles total. Uh, and this would be covered with 10% efficient photovoltaic panels. So we could meet the entire U.S. annual electric demand uh, with a square this size. Now, of course, we wouldn't put all the solar panels here, right here in Nevada. But just to give you an idea, this is, you know, maybe three times the size of the Nevada test site. These are 10% efficient. So, of course, if you were to increase that to 15, that area would go down. If you were to incorporate wind into that portfolio, that area would go down even more, biomass, et cetera. So just, just an, interesting, an interesting thing to show you, that, that you can really easily do this calculation to get here. So one problem with having a, a square of, of solar panels in Nevada is the fact that, first off, how are you going to get that energy and that electricity to where it needs to be? Uh, second off, the sun isn't always shining. So one problem with renewable energy technologies, of course, is that they're intermittent. So the wind isn't always blowing, the sun isn't always shining. It is night sometimes, and especially at night, we like to use uh, we like to use electricity and we like to use energy. So one thing that we have to do is find some kind of interface between this intermittent resource and the constant demand for energy and electricity. So of course, the solution to that is some form of energy storage. We have a lot of options for energy storage, both chemical and physical. Hydrogen batteries and other forms of hydrocarbons would be examples of chemical energy storage options. Hydrogen is what I'm going to talk about tonight as a solution to this energy storage issue. Uh, physically, of course, you can talk about flywheels or pumped hydro. Pumped hydro is something that we actually practice now. You pump water uphill when you don't have peak demand. And when you do have peak demand, you just slow that water back downhill and you make electricity again. So that's one way to store energy in a physical way. So these are, of course, I just have kind of a, a few examples here, uh, some of the more promising. So I'm going to outline what's called a renewable hydrogen economy. So the production of hydrogen, uh, primarily from water, also from other feedstocks, such as small amounts of biomass, um, its distribution and its utilization as an energy carrier. 
And this is important to point out, that hydrogen is an energy carrier, and it's a form of energy storage. It's not a fuel in itself, right? You can't go mine hydrogen. It doesn't exist in its natural state of H2. It's locked up in other molecules. So it's locked up in water, for example. And so this serves a, as a way for us to store electricity or store energy until we want to use it at a later date. And just to give you an idea of kind of some of the steps, of course, that would be involved, uh, we would produce hydrogen from some feedstock, either water or biomass. To do that, we would need to have some kind of energy input into it. And I, of course, propose carbon-free electricity, uh, some kind of carbon-free electricity. Uh, then it has to be distributed. It's either made on site and used there, or it would be distributed to a user. And then, of course, it's utilized both for stationary, in other words, you know, residential electricity applications, or for transportation applications, so in vehicles. Uh, and of course, encompassing all of this is the need for codes and standards, safety, and public education and awareness. So if I were to put this all into pictures, this is kind of what it would look like. Uh, we would take some kind of carbon-free electricity. Here I have renewable electricity. And that would be interfaced with an electric grid. So during peak demand, of course, all of that electricity would be being used through the electric grid uh, where it's needed. And during non-peak uh, hours or non-peak demand, you would take that electricity that's being generated and you would run it to what's called an electrolyzer. So using that, you can split water apart into its component hydrogen and oxygen, and you then store that hydrogen. So here is what uh, actually liquid hydrogen storage tank looks like. Then say you have peak demand and your energy demand has just gone back up. You're not making as, uh, enough electricity from your intermittent sources here. You can then run that hydrogen through either a fuel cell or some kind of engine and make electricity back again. That electricity then can then be used, of course, where it's needed. Another option then, uh, safe for vehicles and for fueling for a transportation infrastructure, would be to run that electricity through the electric grid and use it on, for on-site electrolysis and fueling, or of course to pump or pipeline some of that stored hydrogen to fueling stations as well. And so both of these applications either transported hydrogen or on-site produced hydrogen uh, can be used to fuel either fuel cell or hydrogen internal combustion vehicles. And this is not a new idea, and some of you may have seen this, this quote before, but this is a quote from over 100 years ago. So Jules Verne wrote in The Mysterious Island, yes, my friends, I believe that water will one day be employed as fuel that hydrogen and oxygen, which constitute it, used singly or together, will furnish an inexhaustible source of heat and light, of an intensity of which coal is not capable. Water will be the coal of the future. And I just think that that's something interesting, that over 100 years ago, somebody kind of thought of this idea, maybe not in the context with which we're describing it now. And if I were to kind of break down these, these chunks or these sections of the hydrogen economy, first we have to talk about hydrogen production. Well, how do we make it? If we're talking about renewable pathways to hydrogen production, uh, starting with solar energy, because almost everything except for geothermal starts with solar energy, uh, we can kind of outline pathways that use both wind, solar, and biomass to get there. So here, if we were to start with solar energy, uh, which heats up the earth, that's actually what creates wind, uh, drives mechanical energy, which can create electricity. You can use that for electrolysis for the production of hydrogen. You can also harness solar electricity directly or solar energy directly using photovoltaic panels, so direct conversion of photons to electrons, uh, running that through an electrolyzer, which makes hydrogen. Of course, biomass can capture those photons or that solar energy. Uh, that can be converted into hydrogen directly. Uh, over here, what I have are a few uh, direct uh, methods towards making hydrogen from sunlight. This is actually a photobiological application where the, this algae can actually directly produce hydrogen. Uh, and this is called photoelectrochemical hydrogen production, uh, where you actually can directly split water or electrolyze water using sunlight at the surface of a material. So depending on where that electricity comes from uh, for making hydrogen that we're going to use in fuel cell vehicles or internal combustion uh, hydrogen vehicles, there's going to be some kind of CO2 associated with that, of course, depending on where the electricity comes from. So if we were to replace hydrogen for gasoline, so I'm kind of doing this, this calculation per gallon of gasoline, 
Uh, of course, point source is a tailpipe of a fuel cell vehicle. You have no emissions. You actually just have water and heat. Now, of course, depending on where that source of electricity is that you use for electrolysis, you're going to have some kind of emissions. If you were to pull that electricity off of the grid, uh, the electric grid, and that electric grid was coal electricity, which it is in a lot of places, uh, you would actually be producing four times the amount of carbon dioxide uh, than you would if you were to just burn a gallon of gasoline in your car. So if you were to produce that hydrogen through the reforming of natural gas, not using a natural gas power plant, but actually directly reforming natural gas, you'd produce about half of the carbon dioxide emissions as a gallon of gasoline. And if you were to produce that electricity using wind or solar or some other carbon-free electricity, uh, you would essentially be producing very negligible carbon dioxide emissions. So water electrolysis actually proceeds by two metal electrodes that are in solution. You can apply an electric current across those and they split water apart. So using electricity, you essentially just bust that water apart into both hydrogen and oxygen. And what I'm showing here are some huge electrolyzers, just to give you an idea of what an electrolyzer might look like in a real working situation. So here I have a diagram showing you know, hydrogen and oxygen being produced by splitting water apart and what a real electrolyzer uh, might look like. And I think that this is actually a Norsk hydro electrolyzer, if anybody's interested. This is something that we can demonstrate on the large scale. In fact, we have a whole industry here uh, that is based on electrolysis as a technology, and that's the chloralkali industry. Uh, one thing that, that I want to say is for U.S. passenger vehicles, if we were to convert all of the passenger vehicles in the U.S. to fuel cell vehicles, you can calculate that you'd need about 150 million tons per year of hydrogen to do that. And I just want to give you that number so you can kind of put that in perspective of you know, how much technology this would take. Well, currently we, we make about 40 million tons per year of hydrogen in the U.S. It's you know, a, few, a few times smaller than that that we would need. Uh, most of this hydrogen is used on site, and most of it is produced from natural gas reforming, not from electrolysis. However, electrolysis, and what I'm showing you here in this picture, is part of the chloralkali industry. In other words, the chlorine production industry, which is a huge industry that makes 13 million tons of chlorine per year. It's used in chemical refining. Uh, so this just gives you an example of, of a technology that this is based in the real world. This is something that does exist and that we can do on a fairly large scale. The next part of the picture, or piece of the puzzle, uh, would be storing and transporting that hydrogen that we're making. So whether it's coming from steam reforming or from electrolysis, how are we going to store it and how are we going to get it to where it needs to be? Well, one problem with hydrogen is that it has a very high gravimetric energy density, meaning there's a lot of energy per mass of it. However, it has a very low volumetric energy density. So per volume, you need a whole lot more to get the same amount of energy. So here I've shown you that uh, the amount of hydrogen that you would need to, say, send a fuel cell car 300 miles is equivalent to about 3,000 times the volume that a gasoline tank would be for the same, uh, the same amount. So this is, of course, uncompressed. So this is just, if we just had you know, a balloon filled with hydrogen, essentially, it would be 3,000 times the, the volume of your gas tank. So you can imagine that's, that's huge. You probably wouldn't want to drive a car around that's that big. So we have a few options, a few things to think about in doing this. Um, one is on-site generation to, to kind of solve some of the transport issues. Uh, but from a storage point of view, uh, both a compressed gas, you can, you can compress it and compress gas tanks at very high pressure. That really does decrease the volume quite a bit. Uh, it can be piped in pipeline. I'm going to show you an example of that. Uh, it can be uh, cooled down to liquid, however, that's something that takes a lot of energy to do. It makes a lot more sense to compress it into a gas than to try to liquefy hydrogen. It can be stored as a solid in nanotubes and metal hydrides. I'll touch on this briefly. This is actually some of the research that's being done here. Uh, or it can be converted, uh, chemically converted into some other kind of liquid fuel carrier. So gas transport is yet another industry that does exist here in the United States and abroad. This is something that's done all the time, nothing new. Uh, just to show you what you know, a liquid hydrogen tanker looks like, a compressed uh, hydrogen tanker looks like. So if it were to be trucked, for example, uh, that's something you could expect to see. However, something to point out is that pipelines do exist 
uh, not only for natural gas transport, but for hydrogen transport as well. So what I'm showing you here is kind of Texas and Louisiana, and these are all uh, near, of course, fuel refineries. Uh, but all the red here are existing hydrogen pipelines. So we have about 700 miles of existing hydrogen pipelines in the United States. Now, of course, this is something that would have to be increased dramatically in order to transport the amount of hydrogen that we're talking about. But obviously, this is something that, that does exist currently and is in practice. For storing on board in a vehicle, uh, there's a lot of options for low volume hydrogen storage. Uh, what I'm showing here is a very high pressure 10,000 PSI hydrogen tank. And this tank does have a 300 mile range. It's made out of a carbon composite material, uh, which makes it ex actually extremely light, much lighter than a high pressure steel gas tank would be. Uh, what, uh, something else I'm showing here is a, a metal hydride tank. So this actually contains a chemical that absorbs hydrogen or chemically absorbs it. Uh, and this size tank, which is smaller than this, actually has about a 200 mile range. So this is actually just a prototype technology. And I just wanted you to see, okay, well, what would it look like maybe if this was mounted on my car? Where would this be? So now that we've stored it and say maybe we've transported it to where we need it to be or we've fueled up our car, now we have to worry about using it. Okay, so how are we going to extract energy back out of it? Uh, two applications, of course, I said hydrogen really does blur the line between stationary electricity generation and transportation fuel. You can really use it for both. So if we had stationary power, it could be either a central or distributed technology. In other words, we could have you know, a huge power plant that makes electricity that kind of pipes it out. Or it could be in the more distributed form, either on your house or you know, in a much smaller, um, maybe neighborhood type of setting. Uh, so you would use that stored hydrogen for peak demand electricity uh, when you can't produce enough electricity from your carbon-free sources. And that you can use fuel cells or turbines uh, to generate electricity from that. In transportation, you have two options, fuel cells or internal combustion engines. Both are things that can use hydrogen. And if you're interested, you can actually convert your own car now into an internal combustion hydrogen car. There's some companies out there that will do it for a nominal fee, of course. So to talk about fuel cells, which are a much more efficient way to convert that chemical energy into electricity, a fuel cell is essentially an electrolyzer that runs backwards. So a fuel cell involves metal electrodes, an anode and a cathode, and instead of taking electricity and making hydrogen and oxygen, they take hydrogen and oxygen and make electricity. So the chemical combination, or the electrochemical combination of these two, actually forces electrons around in a circuit and can drive some kind of electrical load. Uh, for example, uh, an electrical engine in your car. So this is what a fuel cell stack looks like. So this has a whole bunch of these all stacked together in order to make one extremely powerful or uh, high power device. So you could think of this as a generator. We have to supply fuel externally, just like in a diesel generator, and what you get out of it is some kind of usable energy, electricity. This is a technology that you can see driving around on the road. Uh, these pictures are actually from the California Fuel Cell Partnership. And these are actually vehicles representing all the major car companies. So every major car company does have either a hydrogen internal combustion or a hydrogen fuel cell vehicle on the road right now. And none of them look too strange or, or too different. Maybe, maybe this guy right here, but uh, you can see that, that these are all <coughs> fairly normal looking cars, and these are from all the major car companies. And if you're interested a little bit more in these cars and say their range, how far they can go on one refuel, uh, you can kind of check out the website for this, the fuelcellpartnership.org. So of course the last, the last part of the picture and everybody, everybody likes to ask this question, well, how safe is it? I mean, isn't it really explosive? We all did you know, that experiment, I think, in middle school where you fill a balloon up with hydrogen and then you, you light a match and you, know, you burn through the balloon and your science teacher makes a very scary explosion. But I think that some of the most referenced unsafe situations are, one, the Hindenburg, which is what this is. This is probably a fairly familiar image to everybody. And then, I'm not sure if everybody knows what this is, but this is a, an H-bomb. Uh, just, just to kind of briefly touch on both of these things, the Hindenburg did not go down in flames because of the hydrogen that was on board. And this is a very common misconception. The Hindenburg was actually coated uh, in an extremely flammable material on its skin. It was ignited 
the hydrogen that was in it burned up really quickly. Uh, what actually burned for a very, very long time was all the diesel fuel that was on board of it. And people don't realize this. In fact, most of the deaths that occurred on the Hindenburg were from people jumping out of it, not from pe the people who stayed in and burned. So this is something to keep in mind. The Hindenburg is not at all a good example of the safety potential of hydrogen. Do you have a comment? Is there a survival for exposure for Hydrogen is such a light, diffuse gas, it's going to go straight up. So if you're below it, you're not going to burn up. So this is, this is a common misconception. Uh, so, and then of course the hydrogen bomb. Your car driving around with a tank of hydrogen in the back is not a nuclear weapon, um, <laughs> right? The reason that the reason that the hydrogen bomb goes off is because there there is a fission device inside of it. So it does take nuclear material in order to make this actually a weapon. So, so these are not at all related. And so I'm just trying to kind of clear up some of the confusion about you know what does having hydrogen in a tank mean? Well, having hydrogen in a tank, um, we can show, and people do this, they crash cars together and they drop tanks off of buildings and they shoot them with guns in order to show the safety of hydrogen. And these are actually clips out of a movie. Uh, I think you can probably download this movie on YouTube by now. Um, <laughs> but here on the, on the left is a hydrogen-fueled vehicle. The hydrogen tank is obviously in the trunk, if you couldn't tell. Uh, and then here on the right is a gasoline vehicle. And so what they did is they actually simulated a fuel leak uh, with an equivalent energy release from both vehicles. And what they're showing here is you can see the hydrogen after three seconds, the hydrogen after one minute, and you can see the difference here. And the real difference is that hydrogen is such a light element, it really very rapidly diffuses. Um, so it's going to go straight up. It's not going to pool underneath your car like gasoline is. Gasoline is a liquid. It's much heavier than air. It's going to pool underneath your car. Uh, and they did, of course, record the internal temperature on this vehicle. And the temperature change in this vehicle versus the temperature change here in this vehicle um, obviously was quite, quite a bit different. Um, another thing to point out is that hydrogen is non-toxic. So spills of hydrogen into your groundwater are not really something that you do have to worry about in your neighborhood. But something to point out, of course, with any fuel, there are and there always will be safety considerations that need to be taken into account. That's the nature of fuel. Fuel is combustible. Uh, so just like with natural gas, we have to be very careful in our house. Uh, we add something to it so that we can smell it if, if it's leaking, because that's very dangerous. Uh, so we, of course, are always going to have to have codes and safety and standards in place for any type of fuel, uh, existing or not existing yet. So I just want to point out some of the technical hurdles. I've kind of shown you a lot of technology that does exist, uh, that is out there, right? There's these cars driving around the road. But probably a lot of you are saying, well, OK, if there's all these cars driving around, how come I don't have one? Or how come you know, nobody's selling me one, at least? Uh, and these are, of course, just a few of the hurdles towards getting here. And these are some of the technical hurdles. So to hydrogen storage, of course, the issue is its high volumetric uh, density. And so we need to try to, to store it, uh, either high pressure tanks or some kind of solid materials, hydrides, nanostructures. So there's a lot of research going on in solid materials for hydrogen storage, for example. Uh, for a fuel cell, fuel cells currently cost a lot. And a lot of that's associated with the activity of the catalysts that are in the fuel cells. Catalysts are made out of platinum, and platinum is a very expensive material. Uh, so trying to find a more active material, in other words, something that we can use less of. Also, uh, the membrane materials and fuel cells, uh, those are still quite expensive and do make up a large chunk of the overall cost of a fuel cell. And man some of the manufacturing of what are called bipolar plates, which I didn't talk about, uh, which are parts of a fuel cell. Uh, to go to, uh, you know, of course, a very high throughput manufacturing process, we need to not have people in a lab machining these by hand, right? We need to be able to make these um, on the order of millions. Uh, of course, cost, and that's not a technical hurdle, but there are technical hurdles associated with the cost. Um, overall cost of fuel cells, the overall cost of producing hydrogen, which, if you're doing it by electrolysis, is dictated by the cost of electricity. And of course, the cost of implementing an infrastructure, whether it's pipeline uh, delivery or distributed generation fueling. 
uh, either one of those. Of course, there's always a cost involved, and that infrastructure uh, may be different than our existing infrastructure for electricity. And public perception being the last of those hurdles, especially with things like safety. So especially with things like this, this Hindenburg vision that I think everybody has and everybody uh, essentially thinks that hydrogen is very unsafe. So we know some of the technical hurdles, and of course these are things that I pointed out that we're doing research in. And so I kind of wanted to talk about where does SLAC fit in? And so you all came to SLAC knowing that it's the Stanford Linear Accelerator Center. Here's a picture of the linear accelerator. And then what little, what not very many of you know is that associated with SLAC is something that's called the Stanford Synchrotron Radiation Laboratory, or SSRL for short. Uh, we're going to fit in as many acronyms as we can. And so what the synchrotron radiation lab is, is uh, actually a high power X-ray source. And the X-rays uh, here at SSRL, which is really just right down the street, uh, can be used to probe the properties of materials on an atomic level. So this is a, a very high power uh, source for research uh, and for understanding some of the fundamentals and technological hurdles to using these materials, say understanding materials for hydrogen storage or understanding catalysts uh, for fuel cell efficiency. Some of the hydrogen storage research at SSRL, uh, we're looking at these materials called nanotubes. What they are are just essentially these tubes of carbon or graphite sheets kind of rolled up. And these nanotubes, and this is what one on a molecular level would look like, uh, actually store hydrogen through a process that's called hydrogenation. So the bonds in between the carbons can actually break and adsorb hydrogen. And then you can extract that hydrogen back off. But this is one way to kind of lower the volume uh, of a stored amount of hydrogen so that hopefully we can you know, fit more and more hydrogen, say, onto a vehicle or in the, you know, the same amount of space as a regular gas tank in a vehicle. Another area of research is in hydrogen production. I briefly mentioned photoelectrochemical hydrogen production. And this is something that's being looked at uh, here at SSRL. And this is actually an example of a material uh, it's a semiconductor material. It's kind of like a solar panel, but you can put it in water and you shine light on it. And directly at the surface, you can actually electrolyze water into hydrogen and oxygen. So the benefit of something like this is that you reduce the overall system cost because now you've gotten rid of you know, having an electrolyzer and a solar panel. You combine these into one device. You can also increase efficiency by combining devices together. Do you have a question? Uh, it would be some kind of ionic solution, yeah. So or acidic solution? Uh, uh, that depends. <laughs> uh, there are materials out there that are about 12% efficiency. So if you think of converting then photo, like a photovoltaic panel coupled to an electrolyzer. So if you have a 10% photovoltaic panel coupled to a 70% efficient electrolyzer, you now have a combined overall efficiency of sunlight to hydrogen of, right, 7%. Um, so that's the higher efficiency that I'm talking about. Uh, but some of the, the challenges with this type of technology, which is fairly far out, is that these materials do tend to corrode, right? They're in contact with solution. So materials that are wet all the time always have a problem of corrosion. So that's kind of one of the fundamental things that we're trying to study here is, okay, how can we understand this corrosion process? And then, of course, how can you go back then and engineer materials that aren't going to undergo this corrosion process? The last area of research, and this is the research that I'm involved in here, is looking at fuel cell catalysts. So fuel cell catalysts, like I said, one of the problems is that they're really expensive. They're platinum. And over time, they can undergo degradation and corrosion. And so since most of these catalysts are platinum-based, uh, people have identified that, that alloy materials with platinum can actually reduce the overall cost, right? Because now you have less platinum involved in your catalyst. But one problem with these platinum alloys is that they corrode over time. So what we're trying to understand is, well, how does the corrosion affect the particle sizes of these catalysts or the distribution of the catalyst or the activity of the catalyst in the fuel cell? And if we can understand these fundamental properties, hopefully that's going to lead you know, back towards engineering new materials that don't degrade over time or don't undergo this corrosion process. So just to kind of lay out what I think uh, is a good short-term versus long-term approach towards getting towards the hydrogen economy, uh, is that starting out in the short term, uh, if you're going to try to start implementing fuel cell vehicles and a hydrogen infrastructure, is from a carbon dioxide standpoint, 
hydrogen from C methane reforming makes the most sense. Like I said, if we're electrolyzing uh, water off of grid electricity, we're actually producing a lot more carbon dioxide uh, than a gallon of gasoline would. This is important to keep in mind. Uh, starting out, of course, with small scale distributed electrolysis. Uh, and then beginning to decarbonize the grid before we start to do this electrolysis. Uh, and on a long term, performing electrolysis with water, which is a renewable resource, using renewable electrons, so solar, wind, geothermal, all things that can play a huge role in getting towards this carbon-free energy economy. Uh, going towards distributed generation, which I didn't really talk much about, but instead of having large centralized power plants, being able to distribute this, these technologies, uh, on a smaller scale, which when added up together, can add up to huge amounts of energy and electricity. Uh, and using hydrogen, of course, for grid storage when we're not pulling electricity straight off the grid. And if I were to give you a picture of what this might look like someday, um, this is kind of your, your happy pollution-free house. So if you had a house that, of course, is tied to the grid, you essentially act as your own energy producer as well as supplying energy back to the grid. So this house has solar panels on top, it has a small wind generator, but what this is all hooked up to is this inverter and controller. And this controller sends, you know, of course, electricity to your house when you need it, when you're not using it. It sends that electricity to an electrolyzer, which can, of course, produce hydrogen and store it underground for you. Uh, when you, say, flip on your light at night and you need electricity back, it can run that hydrogen through the, uh, through the fuel cell that's in your garage. Or you can, of course, you know, use this to fuel up your vehicle uh, if you have a lot left over. Uh, or you can also run electricity back to the grid and essentially get paid for it. And so this is just kind of a, a nice little happy picture of what a, a hydrogen economy and renewable energy-based future might look like. So I really just have a few take-home messages from this talk overall. Uh, and I think the first thing to point out, uh, if you haven't gotten that, is that this is a really critical time. And that if we continue in a business as usual approach towards our energy production, our energy demand and growth, uh, it's going to be fairly catastrophic. And I think that we can see that from uh, what we know about carbon dioxide and what we know uh, about the link between that and climate. So some kind of immediate action needs to be taken using existing technologies. Like I said, things like energy efficiency and deforestation, well, reforestation, not deforestation, uh, can, can help us get to the point where we're starting to stabilize emissions. But while we're doing that, of course, we need to keep these long-term solutions in sight to get there. Uh, I think that I've shown that renewable energy technologies do have the capacity to meet long-term energy demand. We have enough solar, we have enough wind, we have enough things to make a really diverse portfolio of carbon-free electricity in the future. Uh, energy storage, of course, is the key to implementing that. Like I said, if we're dealing with a lot of these intermittent technologies, uh, we need to have some kind of buffer in between that and energy demand, which is all the time. <laughs> and a new infrastructure, this is kind of the last thing to keep in mind, uh, it does require money and energy. Building any type of new energy infrastructure, whether it's carbon sequestration or whether it's a fuel cell hydrogen-based infrastructure. Um, and this, this is a huge investment in energy and money, so we need to keep these long-term goals in sight. Uh, so where do we eventually want to get to? And, and if that's carbon free, then I think investment in those technologies now is what's going to really carry us through. Lastly, I know a lot of people like to crunch numbers on their own. And so I want to give you the opportunity to go and look at all these numbers on your own. A lot of the, the numbers as far as energy production and demand that I'm showing here are all things you can download off of the Energy Information Administration's website. And this is this website. They have Excel files and text files, uh, all that you can download with you know, past and future energy demand predictions. These are all available to the public. You can make pretty graphs like I made here. Uh, you can do that for yourself. Uh, I really like this website, HowStuffWorks.com. Uh, it's a really cool place to go see how an electrolyzer works or how a fuel cell works or how the hydrogen economy works, uh, how you know, a combined cycle natural gas to power plant works all of these things. The EPA keeps a lot of interesting uh, climate change data. Uh, this eere.energy.gov is actually a Department of Energy website uh, with the energy efficiency renewable energy uh, portion of the DOE's research on it. So you can kind of see all of the stuff in the hydrogen program that's going on, uh, as well as in uh, other technologies, energy efficiency as well. 
UCS USA is the Union of Concerned Scientists website. They have a lot of really good information and really good graphs to steal uh, all about global warming and all about climate change. Uh, and something that I thought people would be very interested in is if you actually want to see companies that are saying, okay, well, this is the direction that we're headed, one great place to look is, for example, Shell's website. Shell has a whole division called Shell Hydrogen, and they outline kind of the roadmap towards a hydrogen economy, and they outline what they're doing uh, as far as their research and their kind of hydrogen fueling stations that they're putting together, and they actually have a demonstration fueling station uh, already up uh, that you can go online and see. Uh, the IPCC, I didn't actually put the website on here, this is the Intergovernmental Panel on Climate Change. If you want to see all these scary temperature predictions, that's one place you can go see that. And a lot of the, the studies that I'm showing here, uh, things come out of nature, science, and the economists all the time that are relating to both climate change and uh, both, you know, hydrogen or a non-hydrogen future energy economy. So I really hope that everybody kind of goes and, and takes this and, and just kind of pokes around to see what is out there. and and kind of formulate some of your own ideas from all of this. So thank you everybody very much for your attention. Questions, and then we'll uh, break in a couple minutes for uh, coffee and cookies, and then you can ask more questions in private. I see one here. From a biomass. So what I'm looking at is sure. I throw away a lot of grass because it's heavy, like a lot of people do. And if I cook that, heated it up enough to get all of the high conservation of hydrogen, would I essentially get a petroleum life? Okay, I'm going to repeat the question. I, I'm going to repeat the question. So did everybody? Okay. Uh, so he's asking if we can combine or take some kind of carbon containing biomass. Combine that with hydrogen to make some kind of more liquid fuel chemical energy carrier. Is that correct? Which would be easier to distribute of course. Our existing sure. So there is research that people do, and it's not always with biomass, but with, say, maybe taking CO2 or, or some other carbon source uh, and synthesizing some kind of liquid fuel out of it. It does take a lot of energy. From a biomass standpoint, I don't think that there is even close to enough biomass in order to be able to do that. However, people do do research, and one of the ask of physicists that's here in the audience, he's going to kill me for pointing him out, uh, actually is working on, on some research of doing liquid fuels from that hydrogen that's produced. So, but from a uh, kind of overall efficiency standpoint, you would, of course, lose a lot in that conversion, but people look at that from the perspective of, okay, gaining it back in the transport and storage issues. Uh, we have a question here from somebody who's going to be driving in this future. That, uh, <laughs> Well, you have to well you have to burn it with which needs uh, what's called an oxidant or something to make it burn. So in other words, it needs oxygen to burn. And so sure, if you have you know a balloon of hydrogen and you were to light it on fire, it would explode or it would burn off. Um, but like you saw, is that it's very diffuse, so it, it goes up into the air really easily and really rapidly. It's very light and it burns off really quickly. Uh, so in kind of a compressed gas tank you wouldn't get the oxygen to go inside of the gas tank because the hydrogen would be coming out. So if it gets punctured, you would just have that stream of hydrogen coming up and burning off in that way. Let's take one last question in the second row there. Sure. Uh, okay, I will repeat that. <laughs> so the question is, how long is this going to take? So when are we all going to be driving hydrogen cars around? Or when are we going to really be piping hydrogen around underground? Pardon? Okay. Uh, and so the answer to that really, of course, is 
I don't know and I can't say a certain definitive date, of course. Um, a lot of that's going to depend on production. So as, of course, you increase production or go towards mass production technologies, cost decreases significantly. And so those are things in production technologies that we can do, steps that we can take towards getting to that point where the cost uh, now starts to make sense. Uh, one problem right now is that fossil fuels are so cheap, uh, right? I mean, a kilowatt hour of coal electricity is so cheap compared to solar. But once we start implementing things like carbon cap and trade or carbon taxes, we start to actually levelize those costs. And so the true costs, when we start to introduce externalities, uh, start to make renewable energy technologies more competitive in the market. So from a cost perspective, it might not happen fast enough, so it's really going to take some very serious leadership in order to, to push towards at least a renewable energy economy. Uh, so unfortunately, I can't say when. Um, I, I think a lot of these technologies, um, steam methane reforming for hydrogen production, for example, do exist, and some of these pipelines do exist. It's going to take a lot of time, energy, and money to you know, create a whole pipeline network. Um, but starting with this idea of distributed generation is going to cost a lot less than overhauling huge, massive power plants. So okay, hopefully let's soon. <laughs> let's thank Jennifer again, and we can break the refreshments.